This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Hello and welcome to the second of four festive editions of Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. In today's edition, we deliver the second promised compendium of Scotland's hidden heroes. That passage in our programme where Alex features the stories of remarkable Scots who should be household names for their achievements but haven't had due recognition. Now the success of this section of the show is perhaps an indication of the massive interest in Scottish history and also real regret that it has not been properly available to many Scots. So here is the second edition of Alex's Hidden Heroes, stretching from Scotland's patron saint to the first ever female star of the lecture circuit and to a man who wrote the darkest novel in Scottish history. First up though, a Scots labour pioneer who expressed his socialism in bricks and mortar. Now given the subject of uh, today's episodes, it seems highly appropriate that our hidden hero for today should be John Wheatley, uh, the radical socialist pioneer Scottish politician elected to the House of Commons in 1922 in the Independent Labour Party's Annas Morabilis when they elected 10 MPs from the city of Glasgow to take the House of Commons by storm. But this time John Wheatley was in his 50s. He already had a substantial career in municipal politics and he went on to make his mark in the House of Commons. The Wheatley family had come from County Waterford where Wheatley was born and in Ireland and had uh, established uh, as miners in Lanarkshire. Wheatley himself was a miner, then a publican, then went into publishing in the early 1900s where he found his meter publishing a whole series of radical socialist pamphlets uh, arguing for a, a better society but also fiercely against uh, the outbreak of the First World War. Wheatley uh, along with his younger contemporary uh, Tom Johnson was actually the intellectual backbone of the Independent Labour Party, supplying most of the ideas, most of the initiatives and certainly most of the pamphlets and publications. But what marks Wheatley and Johnson out from other great uh, radicals, Clydesiders like David Kirkwood or, or the firebrand uh, John Maxton or the revolutionary John McLean is that Wheatley got the opportunity to put some of his ideas into practice. And when he arrived in the House of Commons, he established himself as a major figure in 1924, when Ramsay MacDonald moved into the first Labour administration, he had a good sense to appoint Wheatley Minister of Health. And Wheatley produced, in very short order, a Housing Act, which is what his greatest legacy was. The Housing Act extended the ability to subsidise, both in terms of amount and in terms of length of time, municipal housing. And as a result of that Wheatley initiative in 1924, no less than 500,000 homes were built over the UK for working people, municipal, good quality standard housing for the people. It's a legacy of which, of course, John Wheatley was and can still be, those who admire him so much, extremely proud. Over the 1920s, Wheatley and MacDonald had an uneasy relationship. Wheatley didn't like the rightward drift of the MacDonald administration and he never came back into government in MacDonald's second term. He pursued his career in the Independent Labour Party in close association with the other ILP MPs. He died at the relatively early age of a few weeks or a week I think, before his 61st birthday in 1930. But could by then have claimed not just to be the intellectual backbone of the Independent Labour Party, but I've seen many of his ideas come into fruition through bricks and mortar, 
Actually, the houses that were built as a result of John Wheatley's vision and ability to put his ideas into practice. In terms of being remembered, well, there is the Wheatley College, of which John Wheatley would thoroughly approve, which has done tremendous educational work in Glasgow over these last 30 years. And of course, the Wheatley Group, the Housing Association, the subject of today's programme, which as we've seen has a rather more chequered record, and it's open to question whether the great man would have agreed with some of their current practices. But John Wheatley himself deserves to be remembered. He is one of the hidden heroes because the substance of his vision and practical application is not sufficiently understood. But he joins our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes. When I was a lad way back in, in Livgay, I remember sitting astonished in front of the television set back in the 1970s when a Scottish historian called Dr Ian Grimble appeared on the scene. And what Ian Grimble did without an autocue and just straight to camera, just like this, was to unveil the life of someone called Thomas Cochrane, the 10th Earl of Dundonald. And as I watched that, I thought to myself, why haven't I heard of this guy? It's the most amazing story, an extraordinary life. A naval captain, a radical politician, a scourge of the establishment. And somebody who throughout his long life was constantly battling with his uh, superiors, but emerged eventually vindicated, having won an extraordinary victory in the Napoleonic Wars, made an impact in, the, in Parliament as a radical MP, and then liberated most of South America. Because that's exactly what Thomas Cochrane did. He was thrown. He was difficult. He was a man that people found it easy to hate and difficult to admire. But the general public, of course, loved him. Loved him so much that one year, less than a year in fact, after being in indicted and convicted of a stock market swindle, he was triumphantly elected, or I think unopposed to the seat of Westminster. Such was his popularity. Looking back on that swindle, was it uh, trumped up by his opponents, by the establishment, by the government? Was he the unsuspecting and unwitting victim of an establishment plot? Probably. Uh, there was circumstantial evidence against him, but later it was indicated that that circumstantial evidence should not have led to a conviction. But Cochrane himself, after a triumphant career through the Napoleonic Wars, a substantial impact as a radical MP, found himself disgraced from society. His coat of arms, his heraldic coat of arms, was dragged from Westminster Abbey in total disgrace. It was a, a, a service of degradation, as it's called. But Cochrane wasn't finished, not by any means. He decided to accept an invitation to go off to South America, where successfully he liberated Chile, eh, Peru almost incidentally from the Spanish, and then Brazil from the, the, the Portuguese in a series of naval engagements the like of which has never been seen in history where a small flotilla of liberation ships defeated the full might of the Spanish and Portuguese armadas which were assembled uh, against them. To this day there is a frigate suitably a, a Type 26 built in the Clyde uh, called the Admiral Cochrane in the Chilean Navy and he's still recognised in Brazil as one of the uh, essential figures in the liberation of that country. And so looking back to these days of my boyhood when I heard about the Admiral Cochrane, the sea wolf as Napoleon once uh, dubbed him, I thought to myself why haven't we heard of this guy? And that's the inspiration for this series of Scotland's Hidden Heroes. Admiral Cochrane, Thomas Cochrane, Earl of Dundonald, uh, victorious and brave sea captain, fearless radical MP, scourge of the establishment, liberator of South America, and eventually restored to full titles on the personal intervention of Queen Victoria herself. What could be a better start of our latest edition of Scotland's Hidden Heroes? and to celebrate the life of Thomas Cochrane, one of Scotland's true heroes.
I grew up in a, a household where the, the names David Livingston and Eric Liddle were spoken about and revered almost hush tones. David Livingston not because he was a great explorer, Eric Liddle not because he was an Olympic gold medalist, but both of them because they'd given their life to, as missionaries to, to enlighten and lighten the areas of darkness in the world, whether these be in Africa or China. There's one woman who stands uh, comparison with these great men, and that's Mary Mitchell Slessor. Her family was from Aberdeenshire, but Mary was brought up in the, the slums of Dundee, and by the time in the 1870s she was inspired to become a missionary, her Presbyterian faith drove her to, to Africa. She was in her late 20s and a, a skilled jute worker, but Mary had a, a further mission in mind. Mary carried her mission to the Cross River State area of Nigeria, that's in the southeast of the country, jutting out into the Atlantic. It was a, a place in the 1870s where male missionaries feared to tread. Uh, many of them had met their, their fate and their end in that area, but that was of no deterrent whatsoever to, to Mary Slessor. And for 40 years she carried out her mission there, becoming known as the, the White Queen of the Okeyong people. She saved literally thousands of uh, youngsters uh, from infanticide, which was one of the common practices of the, of the tribes at the time, particularly when twins were born. And she brought the, the message of hope and religion and faith to these people and devoted four decades of her life until her death in 1915. You know, we're in a secular society in Scotland now. Uh, and of course, there is a suspicion among most people of uh, those who purvey their religion to, to other peoples or, or to assume that their ways are, are superior to that of a, another culture. We're all suspicious of the imperial aspect of the missionary zeal. It was a cover for empire in, in many cases, and that's a, a rightful scepticism. But that scepticism shouldn't change the admiration for the, the faith, the endurance, of people like Mary Slessor. She devoted 40 years to saving children in Africa, to trying teaching people in the, in the light as, as she saw it. Uh, no, no task was, was too difficult, no uh, undertaking was, was too dangerous. She uh, went ahead with that over a period of 40 years. She had an extraordinary effect. She was beloved uh, among the local tribes and she was revered back in Scotland which is why Mary Slessor is a worthy addition to our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes. Today's hidden hero is a, a person, but it's also a book. Uh, the person is James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, uh, and the book is The Private Memoir and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. Uh, just about the scariest novel ever written, but hardly known about uh, outside a, a few select circles. Now, James Hogg was born a decade after Robert Burns, but born in the borders of Scotland as opposed to in Ayrshire. Very similar in terms of the background. Uh, both fathers were uh, uh, tenant farmers. Uh, they were both uh, heavily celebrated in, the, in their time uh, because they were heaven taught. In actual terms, James Hogg's claim to, to be self-taught was much stronger than Robert Burns's because Burns was an educated man and he, although he hadn't been all that long at uh, parish school, nonetheless his father he had tutors for Robert Burns and Burns was ill-educated in the, in the classic. James Hogg had a bigger hurdle to overcome. He was very much self-taught. He had a few months at a parish school. The rest of it was his own reading and uh, and the books that were given to him and he was a shepherd as his father was and he spent a lot of his time as a shepherd reading books and teaching himself. So his literary output in late 18th century and early 19th century Scotland was formidable and Edinburgh of course was the most literary and the most literate society on earth at that time with many opportunities to publish your work, the Edinburgh Magazine, Blackwoods Magazine, a host of publications thirsting for uh, original works and, uh, and very much uh, he filled that, uh, the Ettrick Shepherd filled that, uh, filled that gap. James Hogg went right into that circle. 
So that's how a, a shepherd uh, became a friend of uh, William Wordsworth, a confidant of uh, Sir Walter Scott. In fact, he wrote an unofficial biography of Walter Scott. Something that's a bit fruity in places. I'm not sure Walter Scott would have approved if he'd seen the, seen the text, but nonetheless, uh, this is a man from, despite his humble beginnings, because of the, the mobility, the social mobility in Scottish society of that time, through the literary world at least, he became a very celebrated figure, and his works, his poems, his works about Scotland, his songs, were highly regarded. He went out of fashion uh, for most of the 19th century and most of the 20th century, but has come back into fashion more recently, as it's been realised that some of his works have been heavily edited by priggish Victorians who didn't like some of the uncouth ideas and uncouth sentiments that he expressed. Uh, and it's regarded as certain of his novels, the, the Three Perils of Man, The Three Perils of Women, are, are now regarded as significant novels in their own right. But then we come to this book, The Private Memoir and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. I mean, this is a, a book about murder, about fratricide, about Calvinism, and about pure evil. I, I sometimes think that uh, Stephen King, celebrated horror writer, must have got hold of a a copy at some point in the 1960s and 70s and started him on his, his epic series of uh, frightening novels because this is the most frightening book that uh, certainly I've ever read. If you haven't read it, and that would be most people watching this, then get a copy and read it. Uh, don't read it alone, don't read it late at night, uh, don't read it where things are going to creak in the, uh, in the cupboards and there'll be strange noises. <laughs> you know, read it during the daytime in broad daylight. You'll still be scared, but at least you'll have company. For some extraordinary reason, this book has never been filmed. It should be filmed, of course. There's actually a, a film script which was written by Ian Rankin, no less, a few years ago. And many of the most notary people in Scottish uh, literary circles have tried to get uh, this book uh, uh, onto film. There's been a couple of plays, there was a Scottish opera uh, financed uh, some years ago, uh, but it would be the most marvellous. It would reduce most gothic thrillers or, or horrors to footless whimsy. It is a book of absolute evil incarnate, deeply chilling, deeply frightening, and it would do great uh, as a film itself. So James Hogg was celebrated in his day, not quite as celebrated as, uh, as Burns, and he wasn't the gigantic figure that, that, that Burns was, but nonetheless celebrated and greatly admired from overcoming his humble origins. Uh, he went out of fashion and now recently he's making a bit of a, a comeback. But just what a big figure he was in his time, and Williams Wordsworth wrote an obituary about him. Uh, the mighty minstrel breathes no longer, mid mouldering ruins low he lies, and death upon the braes of Yarrow has closed the shepherd poet's eyes. Uh, Wordsworth also said he was uncouth and had low manners, incidentally, but nonetheless, to get an epitaph written by William Wordsworth is no mean feat. But because he went out of fashion, and now has come back into fashion, and because he wrote one of the greatest books ever written by a Scot. Uh, I think the, the Ettrick Shepherd, James Hogg, is a worthy addition to our canon of Scotland's hidden heroes.
Welcome back. Now it's festive competition time. Last week, we showed the first seven hidden heroes. This week, it's the second seven. The task for you is simple. Out of the 14, select the three which are Alex's favourite in any order. Now, Alex has already written his choices on this very card and every correct answer will receive some much sought after short memorabilia. And what's more, the opportunity to nominate a new hidden hero for Alex to broadcast. In our last show proper before the holidays, we featured Ash Reagan's initiative to break the independence logjam. This is how I introduced it from a press conference at the Holly Hotel in Edinburgh. And of course, I make no claim to impartiality, but we are, of course, well informed. Alba, as you know, proposed that at each and every election, political parties supporting independence should stand on an unambiguous mandate to negotiate independence from Westminster. If a majority of votes are achieved for independence, then the Scottish Government should mobilise popular and international pressure to implement that mandate. However, that doesn't prevent additional democratic action now in seeking the view of people in extending the powers of the Scottish Parliament. So I want to ensure that people of Scotland are able to express their view, and that would be via a lawful referendum on the 19th of September 2024 on whether or not the Scottish Parliament should have the powers to negotiate and to legislate for independence for Scotland. The National Movement of Scotland desperately needs ideas at the present moment to take matters forward. It's clearly not going to be adequate <coughs> to go into a general election and say what we're doing is campaigning to ask Westminster to give us a referendum. I mean, I think we've been down that road since 2014. Uh, so new initiatives and new ideas are needed, and certainly one that puts the initiative back into the hands of the Scottish Parliament it should be one that everybody welcomes. And the fact that Ash is putting forward the bill should not stop anybody who's interested in Sc Scottish independence uh, signing up to it and being enthusiastically in support of it. Well, if you've got the two things, if you've got a referendum showing that people want the issue of independence to be decided by the Parliament, if you've got a majority in an election saying an instruction by a majority of votes to negotiate independence, then you've got an irresistible uh, double uh, whammy on Westminster. You've got the, the two things that are necessary, the referendum plus the popular assent. You know, both the saying that, yes, they should have the power to do it and the people instructing politicians to exercise that power. Very difficult for any government anywhere to resist that sort of democratic imperative. We've always been looking for a a way to bend Westminster to the will of the Scottish people. I think uh, Ash Reagan may well have unlocked that door. And this is what you had to say in response. Pam says, brilliant programme, another hidden hero is Tommy Douglas, the prairie giant. Born in Falkirk, family emigrated to Canada when he was around 11. He was voted the best Canadian ever a few years ago. There's a great film on YouTube about his life called The Prairie Giant. Donald says, what an awesome history lesson on our unsung heroes of Scotland. Thank you, Alex and Tismina, for a great show. Proud of you both. Thank you so much. Charlie says, thanks for another great programme. A great selection of hidden heroes from different walks of life. Too much of our history is left in the darkness. Keep shining the light and carrying the torch. Margaret says, thanks to Alex for passing on his knowledge of Scots history. Love the show. Thanks to Alex and Tismina. SN for RFF says, another excellent episode. I've learned a fair bit here, so thanks for that. Trish said, Scotland's great tragedy that Marie de Guise wasn't successful in her ultimate bid. Margaret says, happy birthday in 17 days, Alex. We share a birthday, as does my big brother. He was seven on the day you were born. I was five. Pity Trump Jr. shares it with us. And finally, Pim says, thanks for another super show. Bringing the heroes together seems to have made them all even more heroic somehow. Hearing John McLean's words gave me goosebumps again. I am here not as the accused. I am here as the accuser of capitalism, dripping with blood from head to foot. How fitting these words would be today. Thanks for sharing. Keep up the awesome work. See you all.
Welcome back. And now to our final three hidden heroes for today, our own patron saint, the first ever female star of American speaking circuit, and a man who rode on a chariot of fire. Well, who better to look at uh, in this auspicious day than Andrew the Apostle as today's uh, hidden hero? So what do we know about this man? A fair bit, uh, given the, his venerable uh, age and history. We know he was born uh, in Galilee about 5 AD. We know he died, the crucified in Pathos in Greece uh, at the age of about 60s, mid 60s, perhaps even a wee bit older. So we, we, we know what his lifespan was. And we know from the, the Bible, of course, that he was the first called. He was the, the disciple who was first called to, to Christ. And that is very much celebrated in the Eastern Orthodox religions and in Scotland, of course. Uh, we know from the Bible also that St. Andrew was a, the sort of person you'd want to have on your side as one of the disciples. Because although he doesn't dominate the, the Acts of the Apostles, or he doesn't, he doesn't dominate the, uh, the, the biblical tales, he, he still appears at all of the, the key moments uh, in the Bible. He, you know, he's there calling uh, first uh, to Christ. His uh, brother Simon Peter was introduced to Christ by... Uh, by Andrew. We know that Andrew had been a follower of John the Baptist. Uh, we know that Andrew brought the, the boy with the, the loaves and fishes uh, for the feeding of the, the 5,000. We know he was in the Mount of Olives with the other senior disciples asking Christ about the end of days and the, and the second coming. So at the key moments in the, uh, in the Christian scripture, then uh, there is Andrew. Also Andrew's role is that the person who was bringing other people. He, he's not the the star of the, 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 12, uh, the 12 disciples, but he's very much the, the figure who seems to hold the, the team together. And so it proved with uh, his own uh, uh, apolistic uh, uh, career. I mean, he spread the gospel far and wide uh, from his uh, native uh, uh, Palestine right through the, the Mediterranean. You can tell all the places which have shrines to, to Andrew in Malta, in Cyprus, in Greece, in Russia, in Georgia, in Ukraine. His activities were, were quite extraordinary uh, over the, the 30 year period as, a, as an apostle. But of course, we know he was the, the first bishop of, uh, of Byzantine. Uh, so he founded the Eastern Orthodox Christian religions in the same way that, uh, that Peter founded the uh, the Roman Church. Uh, so Andrew had a very, very significant effect as an apostle. I like to think the attachment to Scotland is, uh, is something else that gives a bit to his character. I mean, if we, if we believe legend, the Athelstan Ford legend that we've heard about in this programme, there must have been a reason why the Pictish army thought it's a great idea to have St Andrew on our side. When they looked up at the sky and saw the so the cross, so the St Andrew's cross in the sky, that St Andrew's cross, of course, because legend has it that St Andrew refused to die because he felt he was unworthy of being crucified in the same cross as Christ, so had the, 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 the diagonal cross. But there has to be a reason that people thought, yeah, this is great. We've got the, the senior man, that's Andrew on our side. Uh, so I like to think that was a particular attachment uh, because having the a senior disciple as your patron saint is, uh, is something of significance. And perhaps in all that we know about Andrew, there is a real attachment, a, a real love and association of, uh, of having Andrew. I love the, the story about uh, St. Rule or Regulus coming to Scotland <laughs> with the bones of St. Andrew to the furthest corners of the earth, as was delivered to him in his dream and wrecking in the East Nuke of Fife to, to, to find St. Andrew's with St. Andrew's bones. Unfortunately, the, the centuries don't quite fit that as the, as the real story, but nonetheless, St Andrews was founded, and it was founded with the, the bones and the relics of the, of the saint. And despite the fact that these original ones were lost in the Reformation, you can still see relics in St Mary's Cathedral in Edinburgh, which have been given uh, to Scotland by the Catholic Church in more recent times. Andrew, as the, uh, as the person who held things together, as Dennis Canavan reminded us, a, a, a mission of peacemaking and justice. That's not a bad uh, testimony to a life. Uh, it's not a bad saint for Scotland to be associated with. Indeed, we should be so proud of that uh, association and certainly a worthy entry in our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes.
You know, there's a passage uh, in a speech that Hamza Yusuf made uh, in New York a few weeks ago that caused a bit of social media interest. And that was when he said that uh, uh, we should celebrate great figures of the Scottish Enlightenment like Adam Smith, David Hume and Fanny Wright. Uh, and what people ask social media is, who's this Fanny Wright? Uh, and of course, uh, she wasn't actually a, a huge figure in the Scottish Enlightenment, but nonetheless, she's somebody who deserves to be remembered and she's going to be the subject of this week's Hidden Heroes. Frances Wright was born in the Nailgate in Dundee in 1795, but she grew up in England. Her views, which evolved radical, dramatic views, probably owed a, a bit more to French materialism or English utilitarianism or perhaps even socialist utopianism than they did to Scotch rationality. But, but Frances made her name in the United States of America. Because she was well connected and very rich, uh, she uh, came into the uh, friendship of the Marquis de Lafayette. That's right, Lafayette, the hero of the French and American revolutions. Then as a fairly elderly gentleman making his final triumphant tour of the United States in 1825. And because of that, uh, and uh, Francis accompanied him on that tour, uh, she fell in with, uh, well, she fell in with Thomas Jefferson, stayed with him actually, and also met uh, past and present and future American presidents like John Quincy Adams, uh, uh, Madison. She met and liked the uh, up-and-coming General Andrew Jackson, to whom she became a, a great political supporter and adherent. Uh, and Francis' views were remarkable, dramatic, and hugely radical. Uh, she was a radical feminist, she was a trade unionist, uh, she was in, in favour of uh, emancipation of slaves, uh, but she was also in favour of interracial marriage, which as you can imagine caused quite a stir in uh, 19th century uh, America. And for these radical views she put them into practice. She, she founded a utopian community in, uh, in Tennessee, which only lasted a few years, but nonetheless was a, a brave experiment. She was a, a publicist. She got disgusted with the corruption of Tammany Hall in the Democratic Party and she established a, a new political party, the Workers, Men, Working Men's Party in New York City, which gave Tammany a run for its money in the, the late 1820s. So she did all of these incredible activities, but she came into her own as a, a lecturer. She was probably the first female public lecturer, probably certainly in American and Western history, and, and probably just about in world history. And she drew huge audiences to the the Fanny Wright Lectures, there were associations, societies, the Fanny Wright Societies were founded as a result of the dramatic impression uh, that Frances Wright uh, made when she spoke about uh, uh, women's emancipation, slaves' emancipation, women's rights, uh, <coughs> the right of uh, uh, abortion, of interracial marriage, a totally new utopian society that Fanny Wright put forward in her lectures. Uh, she was a publicist, uh, she published newspapers, she had all of these activities sparkling through the, the body of her American politics. She was friends with the, the rich, the famous, she was an advocate of the, the working man. Uh, she was a, an extraordinary lady. She died in a relatively quiet retirement in the 1850s uh, uh, in Ohio. Uh, and although she had a few setbacks because of her views, she was, uh, I mean, she was advocating interracial marriage uh, almost uh, 150 years before Star Trek screenwriters decided to put it on American television screens. Uh, so she was uh, a remarkable lady, well in advance of her time. She was subject to being pilloried and attacked vehemently in the press of the day, but she bravely argued on, undaunted for all of her variety of causes, making that substantial impact. So I think she deserves to be not remembered as a a great figure of the Scottish Enlightenment, because she wasn't that. But remembered as a remarkable woman who uh, was uh, trailblazing in a whole range of ways and found her meter in the, in the new world, in the new democracy of the United States. And uh, regardless of the criticism to which she was subjected, uh, blasted her way through and, uh, and was indomitable in her advocacy of the great causes in which she believed. And looking back, not just as the, the foremost female lecturer of her day and the first public lecturer as a woman who advocated for these causes, she made a substantial impact. And in so much as we can claim her and the Nethergate and Dundee can claim her, 
She is a rightful addition to this pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes. When I was a lad growing up in Livgate, there were four Scottish figures of fairly recent vintage who were revered above all. Uh, that was three sports people and two missionaries. So how does that work out? Well, there was John Panton, Scottish golfer. There was Willie Bald, King of Scotland, half centre forward. There was Mary Sless of the missionary, uh, who was uh, the subject of one of our previous Hidden Hero episodes. And the last person was Eric Liddell, who was both a sporting hero and a missionary. Hence you get five into, into four. I was wondering whether to, to include Eric Liddell in, the, in this series. Not because he's not a worthy of it, because he clearly is, uh, but because I thought he was too well known to be considered a, a hidden hero. However, I've been doing some Vox Pops recently, and I've suddenly realised it's now more than 40 years <laughs> since the film Chariots of Fire made Eric Liddell's exploits as a sportsman so famous. Uh, so the children of the 1980s and 1990s uh, were introduced to this fantastic Scottish legend, but perhaps the, the children of the, of the modern years uh, don't have as much knowledge, and they should have. I suppose particularly with the, the Paris Olympics coming up next year, the centenary of, of Eric Liddell triumphantly winning the gold medal in the 400 metres in 1924. Now, of course, there was much more to Eric Liddell than just being a, a sportsman and a runner. As he said himself, his athleticism uh, was part of, uh, part of his faith. It was the way he expressed himself. He did honour to God. Uh, Eric Liddell wasn't just a, an athlete. He was a, a considerable rugby player. He was in part of the Scotland international side in the 1922 and 1923 Five Nations Championships. In 1923, they came within a a few points of winning the, the Grand Slam. They were a considerable side and he was a great rugby player. But it was as an athlete and a, a sprinter that Eric Liddell uh, had the greatest prowess. He could run like the wind. He was the 100 yard dash champion of, uh, of Great Britain, uh, the record holder. He was one of the favourites for the 1924 100 metre run in the Paris Olympics. And that's where his real claim to fame comes because not in the immediate uh, uh, run-up to the Olympics, as is suggested in the, the, the Chariots of Fire film. It shows him finding out this news as he boards the boat train. It was actually several months before that he realised that a number of the events that he was going to be starring in, the, the relay events for 400 metres, the relay events for the 100 metres, and the 100 metres itself, were going to have either the heats or the final run on Sunday. And Eric Liddell's faith precluded him uh, from running on the Lord's Day. And this is where his rock-hard integrity comes in. And this is where the real admiration comes in. He had run uh, 400 metres. It was one of the events he, he regularly competed in. But he wasn't by any means a, a world uh, champion at that distance. His favoured events were short and he changed his entire running style in order that he could compete in the 400 metres at the Olympics, an event where neither the heats nor the final was held on a Sunday. The appreciation of somebody prepared to stand up to the very considerable pressure, because as you can imagine, the, the tabloid press, just like they are now, went wild about this, that somebody could let down the country by refusing to run in an event just because it was on a Sunday. There was a great admirers, particularly in Scotland, but it was thought that uh, he was sacrificing the potential of a British gold medal. But there were things more important to Eric Liddell than gold medals, and that was observing his faith. As he prepared for the 400 metres, he was very touched to get a, a message from, uh, from First Samuel. Somebody wrote him a note, which he was handed to in the run-up to, uh, to the event, uh, which says, uh, those who honour me, I honour. A uh, biblical quotation which showed that among his colleague athletes there were others who, who regarded his stance uh, as a matter of principle. And so it was in the, the 400 metres in a, a world record extraordinary run. Uh, Eric Liddell triumphed against all expectations and carried the, uh, the gold medal. That's what made him an athletic hero. 
But that's not what made him a hero in the Salmond household. He was a hero in the Salmond household because he refused to bend uh, to the prevailing wind because of his iron faith. He returned to Shandong province and, and pursued his work as a, as a missionary. In the Second World War, he was interned in a, a Japanese concentration camp and, and there he died in the early months of 1945. His reputation was sky high uh, among all of the people he met. He was an American inmate at the concentration camp, later became a very famous evangelist. Uh, once said that he never thought he'd meet a saint, uh, but Eric Little was as close as he'd ever come. So a man who was greatly admired for his iron integrity, his willing to sacrifice everything to pursue his faith. He was little known really until the Chariots of Fire film, known in Scotland, known in sporting circles, known in missionary circles, but not credibly famous until Chariots of Fire. And I think some of that fame has dissipated over the, over the last few years. Perhaps there'll be a revival for the Paris 2024 Olympics as we realize what an extraordinary man this Scott was. In the 1990s though, and uh, not long after the Chariots of Fire film was released, Edinburgh University erected a, a memorial stone uh, at uh, the concentration camp site in Shandong. It carries a, an inscription from Isaiah, which is particularly apt. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. A great epitaph for a great Scot and a worthy addition to our catalogue of Scotland's hidden heroes. I hope you enjoyed our first festive editions of Scotland's Hidden Heroes. We'll be back next week with a festive show reviewing the very best moments of Scotland Speaks. Now, as ever, you can watch us every week at 9pm on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, X, Facebook and YouTube. And in fact, as Alex says, every social media forum you can shake a stick at. But for now, from the team at Scotland Speaks, myself and Alex, we wish you a very Merry Christmas when it comes. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.